What I have for you today is an interesting case of good old old fashioned structured finance and how it went wrong and the taxpayer almost ran into a 100% penalty issue. So let's look at the facts. Frucor Suntory is a New Zealand group and they were acquired by Danone in France. Here is the court decision. You can see the Supreme Court from New Zealand. Um, this case was, uh, was decided 30 September 2022. But the, I believe the first court, uh, the High Court, decided in 18, and then the Court of Appeal decided in 20, and then in 2022 we got the Supreme Court decision where the tax authorities basically won everything, both the adjustment and the appeal. A 10 second commercial. If you want to learn more about international taxation or transfer pricing, or treat yourself to an all round update, or if you want your team to learn or stay updated, please visit my online courses. The fact pattern is relatively uh, complex, so let's have a look at it. We have the Frucor Beverage Group in New Zealand and Danone in France wanted to acquire it. And the companies in play here are Danone Finance SA, which is a group finance company in France, um, Danone Asia PTE Limited, which is a uh, Singapore Asian holding company, and then Frucor Holdings Limited, which was a subsidiary of Danone Asia Limited, um, which was the acquisition vehicle. So then Danone France, uh, Finance France lent 148 million to Frucor Holdings, Danone Asia um, put in 150 million in equity, and that allowed uh, Frucor Holdings to acquire Frucor Beverages for 298 million New Zealand dollars, right? And then a number of other players entered into, in, into the structure. The, the acquisition was in 2002, but then Deutsche Bank came with a refinancing structure, which actually they've discussed with Danone a couple of years before. It was a, a, a relatively well-known um, Deutsche Bank um, financing setup at the time they were going to use in Brazil, but that didn't happen. And so now it happened in Australia. And what happened was first Deutsche Bank Treasury Germany transferred 55 million New Zealand dollars to its uh, New Zealand branch. And then the New Zealand branch lent uh, 204 million New Zealand dollars to Frucor Holdings, again, six and six and a half percent interest, I believe. Um, and, 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 and a conversion right, right? So, so the, the branch or Deutsche Bank Treasury could acquire shares in Frucor Holdings. Frucor Holdings then used this 204 million to first buy back shares for 60 million from Danone Asia PT Limited, and it used the rest of the money to pay back its loan from Danone Finance SA so that uh, um, Frucor Holdings now only had a $5 million um, dollar loan from Danone Finance SA. And uh, BNP Paribas lent another 90, $89 million to, to DAP, and then uh, together with the 60 million buyback and then 89 billion from BNP Paribas, um, Danone Asia could make a $149 million forward purchase agreement for Frucor shares. So the deal here was if the, if the Danone branch choose to convert the loan after five years into Frucor Holding shares, then the parent, Danone Asia PT Limited, could buy back those shares for $149 million, which were paid upfront, not only after five years. So that's the way that the, that the branch got its money. So you can see there's a lot of circularity going on in the structure, right? If we, if we think away everything that happened after the structure, we basically end up with a $5 million loan from Danone Finance. We've got the 90 million equity from, uh, from DAP. And then we've got these, the, these finance transactions with, um, with, 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 with Deutsche, Deutsche Bank. And then in 2008, um, you, you, you get the wind down of the structure. Um, uh, Frucor Holdings issues 1,025 shares to the Deutsche Bank New Zealand branch and then Deutsche Bank New Zealand branch transfers those shares again to Danone Asia as was agreed under the forward purchase agreement. So Danone Asia starts off being a 100% shareholder of Frucor Holdings and it ends being a 100% shareholder of Frucor Holdings. And, and now the, the question is what was the goal with the structure? And the goal with the structure effectively was to generate a tax deductible interest payment from Frucor Holdings 
to the Deutsche Bank branch of the um, of of the 204 million dollar loan, right? But what the Australian tax authorities said is, if you really look what happens with all this money being pumped around, then effectively um, there's only a, a, a 60 million dollar um, loan at play, and and or 55 million dollar loan at play, and and therefore the interest that can be deducted is only the interest on 55 million dollars, and 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 because this uh, transaction was deemed to be abusive the Australian authorities also levy penalties on the transaction. And the question was, A, were they able to, were, were they allowed to re-qualify the, the transaction to, uh, to, to not a, a, a $204 million loan, but only a $55 million loan? And were they allowed to raise penalties on this, on, on, on this transaction? Bearing in mind that Deutsche Bank um, was a third party, not a related party, right? And the court says, yes, the tax authorities were right in doing so. Um, this is the final structure again, uh, uh, just to explain to you. And then the court starts with um, this, this appeal concerns only the deductions claimed by DHNZ, so that's the known holding New Zealand, for 2006 and 2007, right? Because the other years, I don't know what happened with those. Um, an issue was one, whether the Australia, New Zealand um, uh, general anti-abuse rules could, could could be applied, and whether the commissioner's reconstruction under this GB1, which is the anti-abuse rule, under which the taxable income of Danone holding New Zealand was adjusted by disallowing the reduction said to have been claimed illegitimately, and whether you know, so so first of all it was the recharacterization right of part of the loan to 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 actually um, not being a loan and then and, and then the 55 million uh, was not interest but but it was a, a, a repayment of of principal of 55 million and then interest on the 55 million right and then secondly as to whether the uh, the, the shortfall penalties could be could be raised a because they were either um, uh, uh, unacceptable, as in as in not meeting the about as likely as not to be correct uh, standard, which was there. We'll have a look at the law in a moment, or whether they were abusive, right? And the difference is that you could either levy a 20% penalty or a 100% penalty. But as you can see in footnote four, which is referred to here above already, um, actually the shortfall penalties imposed were only two million four six and two million four. For seven, so much less than the 100% that could have been levied under Section 141D. And the court, just here is the structure again. You can see the circularity of the structure. And the court says, you know, um, if we look at the internal communication, and they primarily look at the internal communication of Deutsche Bank, because there's not so much the discussion and internal communication of, of the known itself, but it did find some documents. And for one, it says the purpose of the arrangement, as Danone explained it to the management, under a heading summary in the Project Falcon document. Funny how so many how many projects in 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 house is being called Falcon. Um, said the structure provides term funding to DHNZ at an after-tax cost that is significantly below the group's normal cost funds, i.e., the pre-tax equivalent of approximately minus one and a half percent. Right. And it then goes on to say there is another um, undated Danone Group document which is material. It includes the following section. I've just taken the, 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 the most important parts. It says, one, what is the point of the scheme? The scheme allowed DHNZ to finance the purchase of the Frugor Beverage Group in a way that would entitle it to tax credits for the life of the scheme, right? For statutory and tax purposes, the whole payment was treated as an interest expense, this 55 million. The interest was 100% uh, deductible. Total payments over the lifetime would, would be added up to 66 million, it's 55 plus another 11 million for, 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 for interest, which equated to 21.8 million of tax credits, right? But then for management purposes, Part of the payment was treated as interest, in other words, the 11 million, and part of it was treated as repayment of principal, being the 55 million. So, so Danone was also internally aware that you know this was this was a pure accounting or or uh, or smoke and mirrors trick. It wasn't really a loan because they never got 204 million. Because as soon as they got the 204 million, they had to give 149 back 
to Deutsche Bank in 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 the form of of of, of the Frucor shares, right, or or the, or the forward for the shares. And then with regard to the question of whether um, this the the, the 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 commissioner was right in recharacterizing the transaction. Um, the Supreme Court says in economic substance, Deutsche Bank advanced 55 million to DHNZ, which was fully repaid on an amortizing principal and interest basis over the term of the note. There was never any alteration of substance in relation to the ownership of by, by DAP of DHNZ. In other words, it was always DAP always owned the DHNZ for 100%. The Deutsche Bank never became the owner thereof, and as was always intended, it wound up owning 100%. The net effect of everything that happened was that the advance of 55 million was repaid on a basis that was ostensibly, that ostensibly permitted DHNZ to deduct all payments made, including the repayment of principal, right? And that was what was denied the idea, this 55 out of the 60. Six million, and the court then a little later says, as is often the case with tax avoidance, there was substantial elements of contrivance, circularity, and cancellation. The artificial features of the funding arrangement to which we have just referred are all indications of contrivance, right? So, so um, Danone lost that part of the case, and now we come to the penalties, and the court says. Part 9 of the Tax Administration Act provides for penalties for a wide range of conduct, such as late filing of returns and late payment of tax. It addresses in particular, and then in letter B, taking an unacceptable tax position for which a penalty of 20% of the tax shortfall may be imposed, or, and this is a bigger risk, taking an abusive tax position for which a 100% penalty of the tax shortfall may be imposed. And, and, and the question was, was this abusive or was it just unacceptable? And the court concludes ultimately, the most favorable way of looking at this aspect of the case from the point of view of Fruc or Santori is that the dominant purpose of the arrangement was to reduce the tax liabilities of DHNZ in New Zealand without the Danone Group incurring counterbalancing liabilities elsewhere, for instance, in Singapore. We see such a compound purpose as engaging section 141D. In other words, the court decides that it was abusive. Um, and, and so Danone lost on both counts, right? The, the, the loan gets requalified. The Deutsche Bank structure doesn't work, at least not in New Zealand. And potentially it could have had 100% penalties being, um, I, I don't know, the 55 million or the 11 million. But as we saw on the footnote four, they were fortunate in the sense that it was only um, limited to 4 million of penalties nonetheless. There was a dissenting opinion in this case, and, and, and I think, you know, one of the things uh, the, 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 the dissenting judge feels that the known is should have won, and it mentions a number of, uh, I think, something like eight points. Um, one or two of the points that are interesting is he said that, you know, what he did not agree with here is the fact that, 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 that the tax authorities took a holistic view and looked at both companies together and, 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 and did not treat... Um, the Singapore entity and and and, and the Australian uh, holding company as separate, but looked at, but but collapsed the transaction into into one taxpayer group, right? And second, he said that he clearly felt that the problem was that that there was a deduction in Australia and there was no um, gain taxed in in Singapore, and quite frankly, the the court shouldn't, shouldn't care about that. This was the majority, minority opinion uh, of the court, as I uh, said, but they only lost the case because the majority of the judges um, decided, as we just discussed. I think it's an interesting case. It is, uh, it is, it, it, it is not often that we look at, at old-fashioned structured finance uh, transactions. It's also an old case. It is, deals with the period of 2006 to seven, way before um, BEPS and, and Pillar 1 and Pillar 2. So I want to leave you with a last thought, and that is, imagine if this played during a Pillar 2 era, and Frucor's original, so the Australian um, original tax rate of Danone would have been pushed to 5% before the adjustment was made, right? So you would have had Pillar 2 saying that, uh, that, 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 that the tax paid in Australia is only 5%, it needs to be uh, increased to 15%. Um, how, would, how would this have played out on the pillar two? And, and, and more interestingly, you know, after the adjustments are made, and let's say that, 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 that Australia is then pushed over the 15%, how would all the reversals of these earlier pillar two payments 
play out under the legislation. I think that could be a very interesting, um, if complex, exercise to run through. Granted, under under Pillar 2 and post BEPS, maybe Danone never would have entered into this transaction if that was the case at all. I hope you enjoyed the case and I look forward to uh, discussing the next case with you next time. Bye for now.